And welcome folks, welcome back to Let's Play The Dark Eye. When we last left off we had another one of those dreams. Well, dreams I suppose they are. Um, in any case, we played through an adaption of the short story The Cask of, Mont of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. Um, of course, all of these stories here are by Edgar Allan Poe. I'm not quite sure how these uh, this story is related to the overarching um, storyline that they developed in this game. That is how it relates to the story of Henry and Elise. Um, but anyway, we shall explore the mansion and try to find um, yeah weird things like our uncle. Um, Ah, and apparently, every time you um, enter one of those dreams, he paints another one of those pictures. Let us talk to our uncle. Um, the man's family name has been dishonored. What's to be done? The brother has dishonored your name. Seducing his cousin still in her minority. Once the dread mark is made, it cannot be struck out. We avoid complete disgrace only by taking immediate action. Hmm. Immediate action. Uh-oh. I don't like the sound of that... How we said that. Anyway, um, yeah, by the way, I think um, I'm very fond of the art style. Uh, more precisely, very fond of how they um, chose to um, well implement these um, these characters. I think I think they are made of clay. Or at least, um, well, it it has a it, it has a very, um, yeah, um, so I can't get this thing out of my head, this sentence, okay. So I want, wanted to say that, um, yeah, the way that these figures are made, they, um, it really portrays a sort of A sort of gloomy atmosphere. Okay, I'll leave it uh, at that and we shall take a look at this picture. Which has either been destroyed or that's supposed to be a part of the picture, I don't know. Okay, these strange markings. Maybe it is actually a picture of Elise and he destroyed it in his rage. Hmm. Okay, let us try to find... Ah, there he is. I've confined Elise to her rooms. You are not to help them communicate in any way. Wait, why am... Why am I not allowed to communicate with her? I didn't propose to her. Okay, I don't think... There's much we can do about that. Um, except to totally ignore our uncle's demands. Hmm. Okay, he's just going to stand there, I suppose. Hmm. Now wait to interact with this picture. Are you going to give me another line of dialogue? No. Can I take a look at your picture? No, because, yeah, apparently you can't do that when your uncle is standing there. Let's have a look at our desk. Hmm. Seems unchanged so far. Um, should probably try to find our brother Henry and our uh, cousin Elise. Despite the explicit warning of our uncle not to, to do so. Ah, 
Um, that strange picture that we saw earlier on our uncle's um, canvas is now up on the wall. I think it's supposed to allude to the dream about teeth that we had. Well, at least that would be my immediate um, association. Okay, let us check the room with the dead fish. Did anything happen? No, it's just the same old dead fish. Okay, what about this room that... Okay, these rooms still serve no purpose at all. Um, let's... Yeah, let's go directly upstairs. We shall talk to the... Um, servant that... Later, suppose it, supposing he is... In the cellar. Hmm... Okay, the music, musical tune does not come from that door. And we can, oh, we can knock in it, I think. Come in. Ah, can actually still come in. Oh, cousin, Uncle Edwin has become very angry. He's, he's forbidden me from even speaking to Henry. Oh, it's actually... He didn't forbid us to visit her, but only Henry. Okay. I misunderstood that. Um. Render me a service, won't you? Will you please, please take this note to Henry? You mustn't tell Uncle. I shall be forever grateful. I think this I can do. I feel um, much better. Here, you play. I'll sing. Please? Okay. If you insist. Um, can I read that in intimate letter first? Come oh. in, please. Keep playing. Come in. Uh, why are you? Oh my! Oh, blood! Uh oh, that's not good. And we enter one of those strange dreams again. Ah, okay. Yeah, I think I will. Um, uh, don't make a cut. It will just keep on playing until we end this story. Um, supposing that I don't get stuck in the meantime. Okay. Can we... Can we look at the table, please? Um... Revenge means nothing unless the Avenger makes himself known to his victim. Hmm. I was just going to replay that same story again. Of course, when one takes revenge, one wants to take it slowly. One wants to be avenged at length. Hmm. Um. Hmm. Ah, uh, that's strange. Okay, um.
sir. Return to the villa. Tell the livery that I shall be out all night. They are forbidden to leave the house. Yes, sir. Immediately, sir. Hmm. It really appears that we are replaying... Hmm. That will ensure their immediate disappearance, now that my back is turned. Hmm. Excuse yeah. me, sir. I'm attendant upon Signora Fortunato. She's searching for her husband. Have you seen him? Oh, I'm certain I saw him some streets from here. Over on the other side of the square. Engaged in a business discussion. Thank you, sir. Hmm. I don't remember having this dialogue. But then again, I'm not good at remembering things. Um, hmm. Okay, I'm rubbing here like ah. For years I've suffered his injuries, but now he has ventured upon insult. Hmm. Yeah, we are in fact replaying the exact same story. Um, for some reason I'm not sure whether I made a mistake or whether this game is just bugged out. Um, I was just... Hmm. The agreements are in place. Tomorrow is the day. Chiano, how I've waited for this moment. We'll be rich beyond imagination. Um, I think I'm just going to, yeah, um, make a cut and when we'll be back then I will have, yeah, completed that uh, section again. What's this? It is very damp here. One last time, let me implore you to return. No? Well, then I must leave you. But first... Okay, we're now back. Um, I've decided to uh, show you the rest of this because I think that some of the audio didn't play back last time. Um, yeah, so that should be fixed. Many laughs about it at the Palazzo over some wine. The Amontillado. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Amontillado. <laughs> it's getting late. My, my wife will be looking for me. Let us be gone. Yes, let us be gone. Hmm. For the love of God, what you saw! Yes, for the love of God. My husband will be away all next week.
tomorrow is the day. We'll be rich beyond imagination. Okay, I think one more to go, and then... Yeah. We shall be out of this dream sequence again. The game did not crash. Okay. Um, so apparently, when when you are in this strange limbo world, you can actually enter any dream, um, also one that you had completed earlier. Um, so that's something to look out for. So we shall now look for something different than, that we can interact with. Um, shall take a look at our brother's room, which is not this room, but the other room, but this room we shall also explore. Contains nothing, okay. Off to our brother's room. And it is... Um, completely empty. Yes, okay. Um, I think on this floor there was this very s strange room which had missed, which was missing a wall. Um, I don't know how you can just miss a wall. At least in the real world. Um, yeah, the wall is still missing even in this limbo world. And I think we can use it to enter another dream, yes. Has the game crashed? No. Um. Hmm. Maybe it is just too much for my emulator to handle. Um, or this this animation is supposed to look like that. Again, without audio, I'm I apologize for that. Um, I don't know what this is caused by, but sometimes um, it doesn't play the audio of an of an animation. Hmm. I think I have a clue what this story is about. Um, hmm. Because this reminds me of, uh, vaguely reminds me of a Golden Scarabeus. And there is a, I think there is a story by Edgar Allan Poe which involves a Scarabeus. Um, yeah, without music this Dream sequence isn't that compelling. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know what to say about that. Um, I guess it's art. Beautiful. Hmm. Lee Annabelle. Annabelle. Hmm. And the strange sequence is over. Okay, that was not a dream, that was just a movie that probably should have involved some audio. Um, I could try to play it again, maybe with audio, but then um, since this took quite a while, I think I'm not going to do that. Um, there was still upstairs. And again, 
trying to navigate in this game isn't the most easiest thing in the world. Can I? I can't click on it, no. Okay, there is nothing. And again, having trouble to navigate around. There's nothing there on the topmost. Um, well, it's not. Technically, it's probably not a floor because. Yeah, it, it isn't, but. Uh, yeah. Topmost thing is kind of empty. Um, can we click on the torch? No, we can't. Oh, fuck. That was kind of abrupt. Um, usually this game has the longest uh, transition, transition transition times. I can't even speak. Transition times, but here it was very abrupt. Okay. We are in some kind of church, it appears. Um, containing a picture. Which I can't really give much sense to right now. Hmm. Okay, this is a bit strange. Uh, well, a bit strange is a bit um, understated. It was weird. Yeah. The death had long devastated the country. No peasants had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal. The redness of the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness and then profuse bleeding at the pores. The scarlet stains upon the body and especially upon the face of the victim were the pest man which shut him out from the aid and sympathy of his fellow men. The old seizure, progress, and termination of the disease were the incidents of half an hour. But the Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court. And with these, retired to the deep seclusion of his castellated abbey. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own eccentric yet august taste. A strong and lofty wall girdled it in. This wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massy hammers and welded the bolts. They resolved to leave means neither of ingress nor egress to the sudden impulses of despair or of frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned. With such precautions, the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could take care of itself. In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure. There were buffoons, there were improvisatori, there were ballet dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. All these and security were within. Without was the Red Death. It was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion, and while the pestilence raised most furiously abroad, that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, this masquerade. But first, let me tell you of the rooms in which it was held. There were seven. In the middle of each, a tall and narrow Gothic window 
looked out upon the closed corridor, which pursued the windings of the suite. These windows were of stained glass, whose color varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber into which it opened. That at the eastern extremity was hung, for example, in blue, and vividly blue were its windows. The second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries, and here the panes were purple. The third was green throughout, and so were the casements. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange, the fifth with white, the sixth with Violet. The seventh apartment was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and down the walls, falling in heavy folds upon a carpet of the same material and hue. But in this chamber only, the color of the windows failed to correspond with the decorations. The panes here were scarlet, a deep blood color. In the corridors that followed the suite, there stood, opposite to each window, a heavy tripod bearing a brazier of fire. This projected its rays through the tinted glass and so glaringly illumined the room, and thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances. But in the western or black chamber, the effect of the firelight that streamed Upon the dark hangings through the blood-tinted panes was ghastly in the extreme. It produced so wild a look upon the countenances of those who entered that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all. It was in this apartment also that there stood against the western wall a gigantic clock of ebony. Its pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang. And when the minute hand made the circuit of the face, the hour was to be stricken, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical, but of so peculiar a note and emphasis that at each lapse of an hour, the musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause in their performance to hearken to the sound. And thus the waltzers perforce ceased their evolutions, and there was a brief disconcert of the whole company. And while the chimes of the clock yet rang, it was observed that the giddiest grew pale, and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows as if in confused reverie or meditation. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled as if at their own nervousness and folly. They made whispering vows each to the other the next chiming of the clock would produce in them no similar emotion. And then, after the lapse of sixty minutes, there came yet another chiming of the clock, and there were the same disconcert and tremulousness and meditation as before. But in spite of these things, it was a magnificent revel. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine eye for color and effects. He disregarded the decor of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fiery, and his conception glowed with barbaric luster. There are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. It was necessary to hear and see and touch him to be sure that he he had directed in great part the embellishments of the seven chambers upon occasion of this great fete. And it was his guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. He sure they were grotesque. There was much glare and glitter and piquancy and phantasm. 
There were arabesque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies such as the madman fashions. There was much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust. To and fro in the seven chambers, there stalked a multitude of dreams. And these, the dreams, right in and about, taking hue from the rooms, and causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. Until at length, there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted. And there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before. But now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock. And as it happened, perhaps, that more of thought crept with more of time into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who reveled. And thus do it happen, perhaps, that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, that there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure. The rumor of the new presence having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz or murmur expressive of disapprobation and surprise. Then, finally, of terror, of horror, and of disgust. In an assembly of phantasms such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have created such sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited. But the figure in question had out-Heroded Herod and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are chords in the hearts of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion. Even with the utterly lost, to whom life and death are equally jests, there are matters of which no jest can be made. The whole company, indeed, seem now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger, Neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet, all of this might have been endured, if not approved by the mad revelers around. But the mummer had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow with all the features of his face was besprinkled with a scarlet horror. When the eyes of Prince Prospero fell upon this spectral image, which with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzers. He was seen to be convulsed with a strong shudder, either of terror or distaste, whereupon his brow reddened with rage. Who dares, he demanded harshly of his courtiers who stood near him, who dares insult us with his blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. But in the eastern or blue chamber, in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words, they rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the Prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of pale courtiers in the direction of the intruder, who, at the moment, was also near at hand, and now, with deliberate and stately step, made closer approach to the speaker, but from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the mummer had inspired the whole party, there were found 
none who put forth hand to seize him, so that, unimpeded, he passed within a yard of the prince's person. And while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the rooms to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly, but with the same solemn and measured step through the blue chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through this again to the white, and even thence to the violet, every decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that the Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. Bore aloft a drawn dagger and had approached in rapid impetuosity to within three or four feet of the retreating figure. When the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped gleaming upon the sable carpet, upon which, instantly afterwards, fell prostrate in death the Prince Prospero. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment, and seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, Gasped in unutterable horror at finding the grave cerements and the corpse-like mask which they held with so violent a rudeness, untenanted by any tangible form. Now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel, and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. The life of the ebony clock went out with the last of the gay, and the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness and decay and the red death held illimitable dominion over all. Wow, um, that was amazing. Um, completely did not expect that. And oh my God, is that old man's voice acting lazy? <sighs> God damn! I, I probably only understood one third of it, or uh, one fourth. Half of it because I, my English is not that great, and half of it because his voice acting is. Effing lazy. Okay, um. So. Hope this doesn't play that same story again. Okay. Let us not, uh. Risk it, let us leave. Um. Even though that was. Great story, I don't want to hear it again. Okay. Especially not with that. Lazy ass voice acting. That was also not the story which we came for. Um, it was just some. Well, it, there was a story, but not one that we are playing. Okay, my uneducated um, guess is that we are supposed to click on the fish. Because that fish served until this point no purpose whatsoever. Yeah, it appears that we. Yeah. We enter a new story. Um, oh my god, this episode is going to be probably like an hour long, but I don't care. Okay, that is. Hmm. This figure kind of looks like the servant of Uncle Edwin. But that's us apparently. Um Hmm. And there's the paper. 
Can I read that paper? The New New York or something? Something, something. Okay. Premature burial. Fearful shock follows. She possibly died through sheer terror. Fearful shock followed heart upon grief Tuesday. No, that doesn't. Sorry. Uh, I misread that probably. Fearful shock followed heart upon grief Tuesday last for Mrs. Theodore Shepperton. Citizens of the borough of Manhattan, yes, it is New York, commiserated with Mr. She Mr. Shepperton over the death of his sister, Miss Emily Shepperton, at the funeral of that day. Upon opening the family vault, a sight greeted the mourners of such frightful nature that it is scarcely bears relating. Mr. Shepperton's wife, Mrs. Julia Emerson Shepperton, died, or so it was presumed, some three years ago. However, when Mr. Shepperton opened the door to the vault, some white apparelled object fell rattling into fell, ra fell rattling into his arms. It was the skeletal remains of his wife in a yet unmolded shroud. Yeah. A careful investigation renders it evident that she must have revived some short time after her entombment and that her struggles within the coffin had caused it to fall from a ledge to the floor, where it was broken so as to permit her escape. On the utter, uppermost of the steps, which led down into the dread chamber, was a large fragment of the coffin, which, it seems, she endeavoured endeavored to rest attention by striking the iron door. While thus occupied, she probably swooned, or possibly died, through sheer terror, and in falling, her shroud became entangled in some ironwork which projected interiorly. Thus she remained and shut and thus she rotted. Erect. Okay. Um So we've got a hint of what powers are probably going to await us uh, or someone else. Hmm, a kind of soup. Um Can we click on the steam? No, it's... I don't think so. Okay. Uh, that's just a thing to look at then. Tea, coffee... Mm -hmm. Seems legit. Okay, that's us again. Um, can we grab our... Uh, scarf. No, we can't. But we can take a peek out of the window. And probably hear... Someone knocking? No. Uh, but we can rub the clock. It's late for him to still be out. Okay, that's the person we saw. Uh... Apparently, um... He's a strange young man. A strange young man indeed. Strange young man looking into our... through our window. Um, so perhaps we are his landlord? I would guess. Hmm. Ah, and someone switched off a light. Um. Hmm. Major J.R. Friedman invites the citizens of Milford to an outdoor concert to celebrate the 25 years of independence at the Village Green. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. So 
So we are uh Oh we're married apparently. Um can we take a look at that photo? Yes. So I, I would presume that this is our wife. Um and let's hope that it wasn't that our name is not Mr. Shepperton. And there's the Bible? No, it's the Odyssey of Homer. From all the dens, the one-eyed race repair. From rifted rocks and mountain bleaks in air. The, no, sorry, again. From all the dens, the one-eyed race repair. From rifted rocks and mountains bleak in air. All haste assembled at his well-known roar. Inquire the cause and crowd the craven door. What hurts thee? Polypheme, what strange affright thus breaks our slumbers and, dirbs, and disturbs the night? Does any mortal in the unguarded hour of sleep oppress thee or by fraud or by fraud or power? Or these insidious thy fair flock surprise? Thus they, the cyclop from his den replies, Friends, no man kills me, no man in the hour. Of sleep oppresses me with thoughtful power. If no man hurt, if no man hurt thee, but the hand divine inflict disease, it thits thee, it thits thee to resign. To Jove or to thy father Neptune pray. The brethren cried and instant soared away. Joy touched my secret soul and conscious heart, pleased with the effort of conduct and of art. Meantime, the cyclop raging with his wound wound. Spread his white arms and searches round and round. At last, the stone removing from the gate, with hands extended in the midst, he sate, and searched each passing sheep, and felt o'er, secure to seize us ere we reached the door, such, such as his shallow wit he deemed was mine. But secret I revolved the deep design. Twas for our lives my laboring bosom wrought. Each scheme I turned and sharpened every thought. This way and that I cast to save my friends. Till one resolve, my warring counsel ends. Okay, I didn't understand a word of that poem. Which is probably because it was a poem. And even more so an English poem. Um... And there's the man, who we don't know uh, the identity of, but shall learn, probably. Oh, good evening. Oh, good evening. Hello, young man. That looks rather strange and familiar at the same time. Is something troubling you? Of course not. Hmm. I don't trust you. I don't trust your voice and your look. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, we are probably supposed to look at something else to trigger the next dialogue. Um, hmm. Kind of. I seem to be kind of stuck in here. Okay, that's us. Uh, we could leave. No, actually, we can't. We can't leave. Okay. But we can look out the window at, to no effect. Okay. Hmm. Then, uh, the same young man that we saw before, who is also the same young man that is this, no, it, hmm, okay, stretch. I'm not sh sure My, which. My, it's getting late. <sighs> okay, I'm, I'm officially confused now, um, which doesn't matter because 
all you have to click to advance the story is to click on things. That sentence was rather silly, okay. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Do I look on the clock again? No. Good ah, night. No. Sleep well, old friend. Hmm. So that's not our room. So this is. Room and we are supposed to go to sleep, I suppose. Um, sleep at last. Hmm. Ah, it's been a long, long. No, no, no. Hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, what do we want to click on? I would suppose her. And how about the room? Okay, this looks like a puzzle of some sort. Um, no, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it was a puzzle, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. <gasps> what? <gasps> Who's there? What could it be? Someone? Who? <sighs> Nothing. The, the, the wind in, in the chimney. Uh, a mouse. It must have been a, a cricket. Yes, a cricket that made a, a single chirp. Hmm. <gasps> Let me guess, we are going to die. Um, and are being buried alive. Um, <laughs> yeah. Of course we are. Hmm. <laughs> Ah, and we are back in the real world. Um, so, yeah, um, I think I will end this probably one hour min minute long video. Um, perhaps I will even make a cut in between. If I do, then this video obviously isn't going to be one hour long. Okay, anyway, so when we come back, folks, we will um, continue to experience that strange journey that is the dark eye. So until next time folks, until then.